Hi there! In today's video, I'm going to be assembling, installing lights, painting, and weathering this 172 Millennium Falcon. This is by far the largest kit I've ever built, so it should be a pretty interesting project. Starting things off, I snip and clean parts off the sprues. Overall, this is my first Star Wars kit and first kit from Bandai, and I'm pretty blown away with the engineering. The tolerances are so tight, the pieces pretty much click together like Legos. And while I don't need to use glue, I use it just to be safe. The assembly process is pretty repetitive, so I'll do my best to go over it as briefly as possible. Something I find really interesting is how in the original 5 foot long model, they used actual model kits to detail random parts of the ship. Just in this clip alone, I can already spot free tank holes and other random parts I can't name off my head. It's really amazing to me how this thing goes together. Most other kit manufacturers would split stuff like this into countless small tiny pieces, while here I get such simple assembly without losing much of any detail. Normally on a kit, I will use a decent amount of sandpaper, putty, and a variety of techniques to get an adequate finish, but this is probably the first time I got away without using any of those tools. I only wish these guys would expand into other subjects, but for now they only do science fiction. comes included with a set of LED lights for the cockpit, engine, and landing gears, and they're really easy to install. Whenever I need to paint smaller pieces separate to the model, I like using double-sided tape to hold them in place while I paint them. This tape is incredibly strong and I use it on practically every single modeling project. It's indispensable for me. I use Mr. Surfacer 1500 Black for priming. It's pretty important to use a primer for improved adhesion and much better durability. I'm brush painting these using mostly Vallejo acrylics. To get a nice smooth finish, I thin down the paint pretty significantly and I'm doing multiple coats. It looks pretty messy right now, but it's the finish that counts anyway. I'm not a particularly great painter, but something that helps me tremendously is supporting my painting hand on top of something. Without that, it'd be practically impossible to keep it steady. I'm loosely following references while painting all of this, but for all these lights and switches, I pretty much do it randomly until it looks more or less right. I must have accidentally deleted the footage, so you're just going to have to imagine me finishing these figures. And if you're wondering why I have a bunch of paint strokes on my fingers and hand, that's because that's the easiest way I find to get the X's off my brush. Here's my little friend. His name is Fishy. He just wanted to let you know that if you like what you see, subscribe and maybe you'll see more of him. I continued the assembly on the upper hole, if you can call it that, by attaching all the rest of the larger pieces. I don't glue it in just yet, but already you can see the massive scale in this thing. Now, you might be wondering why I have a whole grill over here. Well, that's because I screwed up and uh, glued in a piece when I wasn't supposed to yet. One of the landing gear LEDs is supposed to go there. Overall, installing these was a lot easier than I expected, and just like that, we have lights on the bottom. Now I move to the assembly and painting of the turret interiors. They're pretty simple, so I'm just gonna move straight to painting them. Despite being black already, I'm priming them anyway. For the gray shade, I found this MRP color to be closest match for me. Despite the fact that the interior will be barely visible, I'm painting it anyway. I thinned down the paint by a decent amount, but because it's black, its opacity is pretty high, so I don't have to do that many coats. 
I'm using to me a panel liner to contrast a bunch of the details that are raised. These two clear pieces are for the engine lights, but I decided to paint them a clear blue color to make them shine a bit better. The LEDs on their own are already lightly blue, but with this it just improves the effect significantly. And here comes probably my least favorite and most tedious part of making those models, masking. Because if I make any small mistake, it's going to leave a big scratch in the glass. The kit actually comes with two sets of pieces for all the windows, because in the original they actually did not use clear glass because it would reflect light in a weird way. But I decided to go glass here because it would look a little odd without it. A very sharp blade is pretty much a must have, which is why I'm using a scalpel here. I'm pretty lucky this kit has more recessed lines around the canopy frames, otherwise it'd be much more difficult to carve around it. But once that's finished, the whole turret assembly just fits snugly into the bottom of the hole. The kit comes with both raised and lowered landing gear options, so thanks to the fit I can change between them at any time. For the grills, Bandai provide us with photo -ish parts, which give much finer detail than plastic could achieve. I fix them into place simply using super glue. Because I decided to leave the ship ramp closed, I was left with one extra LED and I decided to use it between the two cockpits. The kit wasn't designed for this, but it ended up working really nicely. Once again, I'm cutting out the photo edge, and the block underneath is a hard piece of acrylic. You want to cut photo edge on top of something hard, so you don't damage the piece, but something too hard like glass will dull the blade way too quickly. Acrylic is the perfect middle ground. The tool I'm using to apply the glue is called a glue looper, and it's super handy as it allows you to control the amount of glue much better than something like a toothpick. And this pretty much sums up the assembly of this whole thing. It's pretty much the most enjoyable model kit I've built. Once again, I'm using Mr. Surfacer to prime the whole ship. It is especially important at this stage as it will allow me to unify the surface, spot any mistakes or dust that was stuck to the ship. While I did wipe down the model with alcohol prior to painting, with something this scale, I'm obviously going to miss some spots, so anything that would have a little dust spot or paint was uneven, I would sand off lightly and then repaint. It took me approximately an hour to prime this whole thing, as I have to make sure that every single part is sprayed, so I have to spray it from multiple different angles. For the primary color, I found this Tamiya Insignia White in a spray can to be the closest match. Since I wanted to vary the finish with an airbrush, I have decanted it into these two bottles. Before I get into that though, I'm just pre-shading the whole model with a white color. I'm doing this for two primary reasons, one to vary and muffle the surface so panels are more distinguished, and so I waste less paint when I apply the creamy color. I normally just use the base paint for this step, but as you saw, I have a pretty limited amount. I decanted the color not only so I have more control, but if I decided to spray it from the can, I would go for the whole thing before I finished half the ship. I'm spraying this on pretty messily, but it doesn't really matter since I'll cover it soon anyway. Spraying the final color, I do it much more carefully and slowly, one panel at a time. The final finish I'm looking for is a lightly varied and muffled surface. If I painted the whole thing totally opaque, it would look too artificial. From the footage, it may look totally uniform, but there's definitely a difference in the finish. On most models I do, especially aircraft, I do this to a much finer degree, but here if I decided to do that would take probably 8 hours to paint the whole thing, so I decided to do it in a more general way. To avoid unnecessary masking, I saved installing the engine lights for later, so I don't get any overspray into them. 
Installing these at a later stage was a bit more tricky, but thankfully I did not glue the top hole down, so I was able to fiddle around until it fit. And they worked better than I could have possibly expected. They diffused pretty much perfectly. The kit even comes with an easy to assemble stand. Now, for the final part of painting, I will be highlighting individual panels with this light gray from RP. Because of the low contrast between the gray paint and the main color, I can get away without masking all of these panels for airbrushing very carefully. I'm also using a much finer airbrush which helps with getting a nice sharp edge. Finally, after all the painting has been completed, I can move to decals, and boy are there a lot of them. I cut out pretty much every single decal and submerge it into water using these two solutions while applying them onto the kit. It's pretty important to use a proper setting solution to avoid any silvering and adherence issues with the decal. In the past, I would have used cotton swabs to flatten the decal and make it adhere better, but recently I've switched to these makeup sponges and it's the best thing ever. These things absorb liquid much better and you have a much lower risk of ripping or tearing the decal. The decal application is probably the most time-consuming part of this entire build. I'm really not a big fan of really repetitive work, so I'm sure you can imagine how much fun I had here. Funny thing is that these large decals are nothing compared to what's coming next. Now we have 200 tiny decals we have to apply individually, and they take pretty much as much work as the larger ones, with the bonus of being barely visible. I decided to not film 95% of them, so I can just get over with them and build it faster. When all that was finally finished, I could get to varnishing the whole thing. I'm using Mr. Color Gloss to seal in the layer so I can start weathering. I'm only shading in some of the parts now because I forgot to do it earlier. I will come in with oil paints at a later point to give it even more depth. Once again, I'm using Tamiya Panel Liner to make all the panel lines and details much more pronounced. I'm not terribly concerned if I'm messy with this step, because I will clean it up with odorless spirits at a later point. This is where using a gloss coat helps significantly. If I use the matte varnish, this would, stuff would be pretty much impossible to clean off. It also helps the wash flow significantly better. This whole process is pretty fast and satisfying, but you have to make sure not to let it sit too long because if you let it sit for multiple hours it might be pretty hard to clean off. To clean up the residue, I'm just wiping the surface with an odorless spirit moistened sponge. I've never tried this before, but on this build, I decided to glue the sponge onto my pen sander and it's amazing to me how well this actually worked. All this tool does is vibrate back and forth very quickly to sand the surface and I'm definitely not using it for its intended purpose, but it's extremely quick and efficient. Other than removing the residue a lot quicker, it allows me to get into tighter spots and crevices. Funnily enough, this isn't the first time I'm using my pen sander for its unintended purpose. I've used it before to mix and shake my paints much more quickly than using my hand. Through the simple wash, I brought out a lot more life into this model. Before the final step, which is weathering, I'm sealing in everything with this acrylic matte varnish from BMS. At this point in the build, I realized from references that the ship had many random spots from battle damage. To be as authentic as possible, I carved out these spots with my rotary tool to give them a little depth. These were quickly airbrushed over with black paint, but I will be doing even more with oils at a later point. For all the grime, streaks, and dirt, I'm using these uptiling oil paints. I like using a thin piece of wood as my palette, as it allows the oils to soak in properly. I'm using for the most part this brush for all the streaks, as I like its stiffness and versatility. There really isn't one right way to do this, so you just gotta find what works for you. 
Thanks to the fact that I coated the entire thing with a matte varnish earlier, I'm able to dry brush the whole model as the matte finish allows the paint to grip much better. Looking at original photos, there was a bunch of spots on the ship with this rusty light oxide finish, so I just achieved this by stippling down with my light rust oil paint. When painting on all these streaks, it's pretty important to keep in mind in what direction they are supposed to go. On the bottom and top of the part of the dome, they go in opposite directions because of gravity and how leaks form. I probably could have achieved a lot of these effects using an airbrush only, but by using both airbrush and oils I find I can give the surface a lot more depth. These little makeup sponges are also fantastic for blending in a lot of these oils. Once again, I'm using my rotary tool to carve in blast points all around the ship. I'm not doing this randomly, and I'm looking closely at my references while doing this. While airbrushing, I have my pressure set to practically as low as possible. Getting in a proper streak in these hulls was fairly difficult for me, so I had to redo it multiple times until I got it right. As I'm putting in the final touches, I really hope you enjoyed the whole build process. I tried many new techniques on this ship, and in the making of this video. I'd be more than happy to hear from you on what I can improve going into the future. Thanks a lot for watching, and here's the finished Millennium Falcon.